Hello, good evening. Um, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Hello, good evening. I have three goes at that, and this thing flashing at me. I think it's settled down. Uh, my name is uh, Andy Gale. Um, I'm Professor of Project Management at the University of Cumbria. Uh, I'm also Professor Emeritus of Project Management at the uh, University of Manchester, where I worked for nearly 30 years. Prior to that, um, I was working with Bechtel Corporation. Um, I've worked a lot with industry. Uh, since becoming an academic in, in 1985, actually, and um, uh, travelled all over the world. Um, I'm going to make a point of crediting Mike Brown, who's retired. He was the head of Rolls-Royce Project Management Centre uh, based in Derby. I've travelled all over the world with Mike, and we, we, we worked together a lot uh, uh, on a master's programme, which we were involved in. Um, and so some of the ideas in this... Um, Slide deck uh, are um, jointly developed, and Mike has got. Um, it's important to mention mention him. So, um, start off with something erudite. Uh, the beginning is the most important part of the work. Um, Plato said that a long time ago. Um, I just saw a typo there, dear oh dear. Um, and it is sort of self-evident, and I'm sure we've got lots of war stories to tell. Um, everybody listening, listening will, will, know, will know that's the case. Um, we'll move on. The talk is about failure, success, um, and learning, really. Um, we use these words a lot, failure and success, and um, they're sort of opposite sides of the same coin. I'll come back to that. Um, we are surrounded by masses of learning opportunities. And um, one of the things that I wanted to try to get across in this session was it, it, there's a lot out there. Um, we've got nowadays, particularly with the web, of course, access to that. And really, it's about how to look at it and um, how to draw generic lessons from that um, as much as anything. So. Um, I'm going to mention some examples, uh, fairly recent examples, uh, and start off with not such a recent example, actually. Um, but uh, a lot of these examples that I'm talking about, and uh, many others, of course, have reports associated with them that have been done by industry or uh, governments or whatever, which are really useful, uh, I think, for uh, project managers um, in, in many disciplines. And uh, I just want to, to stress that. Right, so and uh, this isn't interactive. Um, we have, there'll be some questions at the end. There'll be interaction then. Um, um, by the way, um, if you could please uh, put questions in chat, <coughs> excuse me, that you have the facility to do that. Please do them when you think of them. Um, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I'll regret saying that, won't I? There's no such thing as a stupid question. If it's in your head, it'll be in lots of people's heads. So just put it down, uh, whatever it is. Um, and we will come to those at the end and um, work, work through them. So the first thing here um, is an example of, well, you can see it's a failure. Um, what, where and when was this? We're not interactive and so I can't sort of get your feedback immediately, but so just write down if you think you know when that was, and what is and where is it? Okay. Right, well, it's, is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge um, in the United States. When was that built, do you think? When was it actually opened and built? It was in July 1940. But when did it fall down? And this is a photograph of it falling down or collapsing and destroying itself. It was actually the same year um, and it was not very long afterwards, you can see, up in July, down in November. Um, and what was it called? They had a nickname, and this is very it's a very important, this nickname. It was called Galloping Gertie. Uh, there's a book called, uh, well, Galloping Gertie, I'll come to that in a sec. Um, and Galloping Gertie, um, it was called Galloping Gertie because... Uh, the workforce, the people that built it, uh, named it Galloping Gertie 
um, allegedly two years prior to this event, which you can see in the in the image. Um, and so it, when the wind blew, um, the, the bridge would sway and, and dance. So they called it up in Gertie. So this is another point I want to get across. This thing about, well, it wasn't so much such a weak signal, was it? But it's a weak signal. Something's happening. Um, can't explain it. Um, in hindsight, highly significant. And at the time, not, apparently. But it turned out to be highly significant. And this particular bridge, it's, it's very complicated to explain the, um, the air wind dynamics, the uh, air dynamics uh, associated with this collapse, um, it, um, which I won't even attempt to. But it's definitely worth looking up if you're, if you're interested in that. Really, it really is. Um, uh, and it eventually ended up destroying itself and uh, create in, in a vortex. Um, basically, one of the things that was a problem here was that they, some bracing wasn't included for cost saving uh, and, and weight. Um, and that was part of the problem. But I'm not going to go into the te te technology of it and the engineering of it, but it's definitely worth looking at. The point, though, what am I trying to talk about here is that it is a failure. Um, it had uh, weak signals. Uh, uh, it had its nickname, um, and it was it was pretty catastrophic. Um, and um, it, it, we look at why it happened and the, all the antecedents. We can learn a lot. Okay. Now, this is another interesting notion. We know why projects fail. We know how to prevent their failure. So why do they still fail? Um, there are a couple of things that drive me mad. Uh, one of them is listening to these people talk about lessons they're going to be learned, because they don't seem to be. And secondly, about anything, frankly. And secondly, uh, that um, it's some sort of system problem. Uh, that, you know, the fact that people don't do the right thing or they make poor, poor calls or they don't behave in the professional fashion um, etc. That that seems to me to be the issue, but it's you know somehow a, a system can be designed that will sort of eradicate that. Well, which is clearly not well. I would argue not the case. Um, Cobb's uh, paradox um, at a conference back in uh, the end of the last century. Um, this was discussed in some detail at, at a major and very significant conference, and um, and it's it's called Cobb's Paradox and uh, you know as I just read out um, useful to reflect on really is so why projects fail and what practitioners tell us um, with Mike that I mentioned and other uh, colleagues from Rolls and AMEC and other organizations I work with on that program all over the place in America and, 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 and the Far East um, we, the, these things that I put on the screen here um, are empirical work. This has come from um, surveys that we did with, uh, um, I should know the number, shouldn't I? A, a, lot, a lot of project managers. Um, and we said, well, why do projects fail in your experience? What practitioners told us are as follows. Involving novelty, anything different, a new gizmo, a new concept, now, I'm not saying for a minute that we shouldn't introduce innovations. Of course we should, but they are also associated with failure. Poor tender or business case development. In other words, not really being clear about why we're doing something. Or, and particularly where the sales force, and that applies in all aspects of engineering, uh, where maybe it could be an aero engine, it could be a... Um, a plant or, 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 or anything we, we can you're involved in listening to this call um, if the people are selling they're motivated by drivers which um, aren't necessarily engineering drivers uh, is maybe overselling or it, it's not doable um, all of those things um, can be a problem what is planned is not feasible then and also optimism bias I put that in red there's some homework from this session so these are look up but people often say to me, how do you know that? And I don't know a lot, to be honest, but when I, I do know some things. And so I say something and somebody will say, 
how do you do that? I, I, I quite often say, well, I, I looked it up. Um, and that's a bit, sounds a bit facetious, but it's surprising how people don't look things up. So I'm putting down some things to look up. So optimism bias is definitely something to, to look up. I haven't got time to go into it. You could do a whole lecture on it. Um, that's, that's an important point. Poor startup. Little attention, poor startup, and also uh, pre pre project planning, <clears throat> front so called front end loading. It's got a number of other names. Another thing to look up. Some projects by some in some uh, sectors, um, there is a gate uh, stage gate approach where up to twenty to twenty five percent of a project's from a budget uh, can be spent before it may be stopped. In other words, to, you know, it's worth not going any further. Um, and you have to spend quite a lot of money to find out not to go any further, if that makes sense. Um, problems with continuity of accountability. Again, using a RACI or RAM or LRC chart. RACI stands for Responsibility, Accountability, or Accountable, Consulted and Informed. I'm sure uh, some or all of you know that. But if you don't or you're not so clear, look it up because it's a very useful in relation to project management, particularly useful. Um, and it's associated with milestones, risks, and, and uh, the stage gates. Um, poor planning. In, sorry, somebody's just. Oh, somebody's just spoken in my ear. Um, poor planning and scheduling. Um, not thinking it through, basically. Um, we all know that from our own experience in our diaries. I'm sure I'm not alone in my outlook. I don't think it through when it comes to the day that I've got all this stuff. Oh my God, should have gone through this properly before. Why have I done this to myself? Poor planning and scheduling. Focus on the financial accounting. Looking backwards, it's absolutely uh, dire. That is a big problem. Uh, it's not management accounting, it's financial accounting. It's, it's bean counting, if you like. So these are the things that practitioners have told us. Um, an example of a failure. Oops, sorry, these things are flicking around, my fault. Um, Berlin Brandenburg Airport. Um, again, some of you will have be familiar with this. 14 years to complete, 10 years late, <laughs> costing three times its original budget. Now, there's an interesting report, a big report, uh, and essentially things that I picked out from that, which I think are relevant. Um, uh, the report said, uh, blamed, um, this was done before the, the thing was completed, by the way, inexperienced management, uh, so competence, inaccurate budget estimates. So that meant people didn't, re for whatever reason, can't drill down on that, but you know, that's a really, if you can't control the budget, then you know, you're not controlling things. Poor planning and procurement, that relates to the supply chain, definitely, and risk. Unnecessary changes, uh, in other words, not having a system, uh, and then I've now contradicted myself, not having a system um, that uh, deals with changes in a rational and a clear way. Poor internal communications, and this is another thing that I, I go on about sometimes. Communication, people often say, We've got to improve communications. Oh, it's a communication problem. I am not saying that's not the case, but communications are a symptom, like um, you know, um, a bleeding wound is a symptom of a cut or an injury. Um, it doesn't necessarily explain the reason. It just you know, bleeding is a symptom, um, and, and there's something far more significant that you've got to deal with. Actually, stopping the bleeding. Or dealing with that's not it may be part of it, but but actually there's something more important. And communications in organisational terms um, often indicates or usually indicates some sort of power issues um, and something dysfunctional going on in terms of the organisation and power and and, and and all that stuff. So communications are a litmus paper almost, and I think it, that's a really important point that to, to make personally. Um, so that's that example. Um, now, um, I mentioned earlier there was a book called Galloping Gertie. Well, it, it's not quite called that. It's something similar. It's called What Made Gertie Gallop? Lessons from Project Failure. Now, Jeff Pinto is a professor of project management at uh, Penn State University who's written a lot. He's, he's a very good guy. Um, he wrote this interesting book, um, you know, quite a while ago um, based on uh, 
examples um, of major failure. And uh, obviously one of them is Tacoma Narrows. And so he's come up with, he came up with 12 ways, 12 things to do to wreck a project. Now, why, why would I look at it like that? When I, I worked years ago in the Middle East and my boss, um, who who used to be um, in the military um, in the American War or Vietnam War, depending on how you describe it. Um, he he used to blow things up, and he told me he's a structural engineer, and he told me you know he learned more about how things stood up and how to make them sound by blowing them up than he did by going to lectures or reading codes. And I thought that was really interesting. So in a sense, if we take this of opposite lock if we look at why how to how to mess something up and then try not to do those things then presumably they won't get messed up so so that's that's why I've, I've chosen to to quote Jeff's work slightly modify the language so first of all ignore the project environment including stakeholders and the environment it's not just the climate I mean I mean it's the uh, political economic social it's everything it's the context and the stakeholders aren't just the obvious ones. They are the ones who um, present themselves whether you like them or not. They might be people that are protesting against the project. They are stakeholders um, and, and uh, ignore them at our peril. Um, rely on new technology too quickly. That's connected with this innovation and novelty thing. So wherever we see new, we have to be careful. Not, I'm not saying don't do it. We have to be careful. Being inflexible if a problem arises, so freezing and rabbit in the headlights, you know, being too conservative, small c about things, that's problematic. Um, when problems occur, blame the one most visible or the weakest link, which is, I'm sure, I, I'm absolutely sure that everybody's got examples of that, and you maybe have been on the receiving end of that. Um, that's not, not, not good. Um, Allow inertia to prevent new ideas from being implemented. See, there's some contradictions occurring here. So on one hand, we're saying, you know, new is potentially a risk. And on the other hand, we're saying, um, you know, we're stopping new, we're stopping new ideas. And, and so there are some tensions here. So there are some interesting contradictions. But I would say to um, oh, my students, What's interesting is what we can't explain. What's interesting is contradiction. What's interesting is a paradox that is worth it, it looking at. For example, particle and wave motion both describe light, uh, but they're completely different theoretical positions, but they both work. And so there's something very interesting about how is it you can use these two different perspectives, right? Um, don't bother conducting a feasibility study. Um, I won't mention the organization, but I gave a lecture a while ago, maybe three or four years ago, actually, um, about because I knew this particular big organization, very big organization, um, had these codes of practice and they're supposed to do these post project reviews and all the rest of it. And it wasn't done very well. Nobody seemed to do um, very well. And, um, you know, so I said, well, don't do them then, you know, if you're not going to do them at all. Um, but actually, if you don't do them, you're not going to learn. Um, and um, feasibility studies um, should be in part based on post project reviews uh, to see what has gone wrong in the past, what's gone right, because they are they're very, very useful data. Um, never admit a problem is a fail, a project is a failure. That's a sort of uh, talking up. Um, it, 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 on one hand, we, we need to keep morale high. On the other hand, uh, um, oh, uh, talking things up to the point where it is it, it's dysfunctional is a problem. So not admitting failure um, is head in the sand stuff. That's that's dangerous. Over managing, over managing um, micromanagement. That, that is not uncommon. Um, I can I'm aware of a situation at the moment in an organisation where uh, I won't mention the organisation. The chief executive is an absolute control freak. Uh, causes all sorts of problems and also prevents, uh, I'm saying negative feedback, prevents feedback, which is not helpful. Um, I can think of another organization where there's another senior person who's so control, controlling, they create a bottleneck. So everything's 
late and 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 the priorities you know you can't prioritize so those are that's a particular issue never conduct a post failure review i've already mentioned that it's connected with feasibility um, never bother understanding a project trade-off so we've got this classic triangle the cost time performance which uh, martin barnes invented and it's been called the iron triangle and all that he didn't call it that everybody other people have called it that um, anyway, Martin um, Barnes invented this thing. He's the guy that wrote the NEC uh, contract, actually, and got a got CBE for that, um, involved with the Olympic uh, project. Um, but he he started uh, this idea, this triangle, and it's in every textbook on project management I can think of, um, where we have to consider the trade-offs. And if we don't consider those, and they are dynamic, they're not fixed, uh, then we've got problems. Um, allow political expedience and uh, infighting to dictate uh, a critical, um, crucial project decisions. So, you know, people, it's people, it's all about people, um, uh, their power relationships, um, the comings and goings, you know, when somebody leaves a project or joins a project or, you know, there is a change of personnel, these things can be, can be pretty risky. That is another cause of failure. And then the last one, the 12th one, make sure the project is run by a weak leader. We could say weak leader, you could say inappropriate leader. And it may be that on a very large project, for example, where the beginning and the end and the middle are three different contexts, there could be three different leader types required. And that is often the case for very big projects. So it's not that it's, the, it may be they're not the same person leading at the beginning as at the end. Um, would be the best solution, you see. So um, leadership and the nature of leadership. So that's quite a useful, I think, card deck. That gives us some things to go at. If we can treat those the risks associated with all those things, then maybe we're a halfway to success. So that was the idea of that, that slide. Okay, another example. 787 Dreamliner, the supply chain problems. What can we learn? Well, quite a lot, really. I'm just going to drill down very, very slightly here. So lessons were learned from the Airbus A380, but they weren't applied to the Dreamliner. So that's, that's another, an example of non-transferableness. Just made that word up. Supply chain complexity was a very big issue in the 787 um, problems. Um, basically, there was a philosophy of outsourcing risk um, to the supply chain, and that wasn't understood. So a risk is a risk is a risk. So if I have a risk, a negative risk, so I have a positive risk, no, that's not really that. If I have a risk, just because I sell it to someone else, now they're supplying me with the, uh, something and they've got the problem, doesn't mean the risk's gone away. I still hold the risk because <laughs> it's my project. Um, now, what happened was risks got transferred so far away from the, the center of things, they weren't even visible. Um, and one particular area was in the in fasteners. Again, this is a big story, which you can read about, so you can look it up. But essentially, um, a huge problems occurred because um, the, um, the way the procurement went for the fasteners in relation to this wing box section um, uh, and it needing to be strengthened and all the rest of it uh, was about uh, the idea that we could somehow uh, outsource risk to the supply chain. Again, I, it is very high level what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not going to drill down here. I'm just saying there is a lot to be learned from that. And I, I, I'm sure that, um, again, you know, it's in the public domain. There's an awful lot of good stuff that we can access in the public domain about these sorts of issues. And I, I just recommend it. Um, you all remember this, deep water horizon, oil spill, um, quite a long time, 11 years ago. So BP and the, and the, and the contractors, Halliburton and, and Transocean, shared the blame for the cause of failure. Um, the technical failure um, was, uh, we won't go into detail on this, but at the, the base of the oil and gas well led to a cascade of human and mechanical errors. So um, it, an explosion uh, ended up with a fire killing uh, 11 people and, and, and 126 crew members 
uh, were involved, um, and 11 of them were killed, uh, it was dreadful. Um, and, and a massive oil spill, um, which was, I'm sure you'll, you'll remember, so it was a pretty major thing. Um, so um, the Oil Spills Commission report said um, that basically poor risk management, uh, last minute changes to plans, so um, you know that that does not sound stable. Failure to observe and respond, so uh, that's poor management. Maybe lack of competence. Um, maybe there are issues to do with communications, and that could be linked to um, politics, if you like, in organisations. Insufficient training, and that links to competence. So serious stuff. These are lessons learned from that in that report. Um, and they, I'm sure they apply in lots of other places. Um, we we can see them in the public domain. Stakeholders and success, all right, stakeholders. So let's consider uh, the Millennium Dome. The Millennium Dome was 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 built for the for the uh, Millennium in London. Nobody's quite sure why what it was for. Um, what did it success when it was built? Well, a lot of people say it wasn't because it was a white elephant, let's say. However, it was built on time within budget, um, actually. It, um, the foundations of success are assured if stakeholder expectations are understood and managed. Well, stakeholder expectations weren't, well, nobody really understood what it was for. So the perception of success is the issue here. Now, what perception and reality um, are the same in a sense, because uh, we are cognitive creatures. So how we perceive things is our reality. If you think of, for example, colours in the visible spectrum, we don't actually know how we all individually see red or green um, or blue. But uh, we can describe it and we can give clues and we can point but we don't actually know what's going on in everybody's head. Um, so we perceive things. We Our reality may be a different perception of reality uh, than someone else's. And the same thing can occur here. So what did the Millennium Dome become? It became the O2 Arena, which is a very, very successful venue. Now, I talked about this in, I can't remember what it was now, I think it was Brazil. Mike and I were doing a talk in Brazil um, to um, Petrobras. I think it was the oil company. Anyway, and somebody was arguing the toss with us. They actually thought that uh, the thing had been knocked down and rebuilt because it, 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 it was an unsuccessful thing, and then there was a successful thing. They didn't. They, they really didn't really appreciate that it was just the venue's role was changed. It was renamed. So that tells us a heck of a lot about stakeholders and their importance and their perceptions and success and projects okay really inter very interesting the associated for project management talks about success um they published a report i think that yeah 2014 that's right um they published a report 2014 and these are the things i've, I've highlighted some things there governance uh, knowing what's going on why who's doing it Relates back to RACI, R-A-C-I diagram. Goals and objectives are clear. That relates to business case. Commitment to success. That's about leadership. Capable project sponsors. So expert clients um, uh, or expert, yeah, expert clients, expert sponsors is a good thing. That's a, that, all, that often leads to success. Secure funding. If you're messing around with funding, there's uncertainties there. There are problems. Um, project planning and review strong support within and from organizations involved so it was a team effort uh, it's not overly transactional obviously we have contracts and people have to deliver but if things are so contractual so um, adversarial then um, you know NEC the NEC um, contract for example is, is one which which tries to address that issue for example um, that if things are too uh, transactional, then, then there's problems. Um, end user involvement, people who are going to use or, or, or yeah, use the, the facility or whatever is being made or, or built or, or, or delivered uh, is it, crucial. Um, examples of that 
at uh, listen to a project manager from government talking about the um, uh, problems with with services when they're they're issued. You know, the government decides to do a new service, but if, if often end users, uh, you and me, aren't involved, um, and you know. COVID is a good example of that. Uh, how many frontline people were involved in these big decisions? Uh, that's a big, big issue. Come, I'll come back to COVID again. Um, competent project team, supply chain alignment, effective. So again, you know, that the, um, the, 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 the nature of the supply chain, where the risk resides, project management tools, robust and flexible, not an over-reliance on tools, appropriate tools and robust tools, appropriate regulatory environments. So, um, we're not um, into tick box here. We're doing. We we're, we understand where we are on that front. Um, in order, it, it's interesting you see stakeholders because if we look at this, I, I don't know who was listening that's, that's used this. Some organisations use this uh, to identify this thing called the Crawford um, Ishikura Factor Table for evaluating roles, or the SIFTA, which we call it, SIFTA Complexity Model. Um, some organizations use this in order to establish who the project manager should be for a project. And when I say who, uh, not necessarily by name, uh, but by, by experience. And then they say, well, so and so is, this, this has this level of experience. And so they look at the project and, and they use this. Um, it, 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 it's um, a frame of reference for analyzing the complexity and then establishing how experienced does a project manager need to be for this project. Um, and factor six, there are a number of factors in SIFTA, says stakeholder alignment regarding the characteristics of product uh, of the product of the project. So in other words, success. Um, so the question is, if stakeholders have divergent objectives, can the project be successful? Um, um, the new rail link, um, for example, um, I've heard about six different objectives um, over over several years, and there are a lot of different stakeholders. Um, well, there's government, there's the public, there's the rail companies, you know. So, so if they're not entirely aligned, uh, how does that work in terms of complexity, and how does that work in terms of success, for example? Um, so, if we look at the um, at the model. Um, it's, there are seven items on it, and you can see there's this um, uh, subjective scaling system. But it is used; uh, that people are trained to use this, a bit like you know, a bit like risk um, assessments. Um, and as I say, uh, some large organisations use this this model, and it, I'd definitely um, suggest looking this up if you're not familiar with it. Um, the um, Crawford um, is uh, a professor um, in uh, Sydney, um, and uh, she's very she's been very very involved in project management um, education and, um, and and consultancy uh, for years, and uh, so she she's behind this really. Um, lessons from COVID. Um, I'm not long to go now, so uh, if you've got any questions, don't forget. Lessons from COVID-19. I, I, I've been looking at what's been published on that. Um, obviously, we all have a stake. We're all stakeholders. Um, planning and preparedness will always... So this is a report or a paper that was uh, published last year. Um, and I drew out some things from that, which uh, I thought, well, these may have some generic, potentially transferable generic uh, potential here. Planning and preparedness would always trump technological reaction and, and adaption. So I have to really think about that. Um, interesting. Planning and preparedness. Sounds boring. Very important. Always trump technological reaction and adaption. There can be no substitute. This is either quotations from the, from the paper or, or, or my paraphrasing. Um, there can be no substitute for actionable and feasible emergency preparedness, again, preparedness, and resilience plans devoid of short-term politicization. <laughs> Doesn't need that much explanation. That if you don't invest in developing resilience through financial resources and strategic direction, your likelihood of success is reduced. We can apply that in all sorts of situations, but it's not just COVID. 
seems to be. And then it got me thinking about, you know, um, there's lots of, started off with Plato. Here's a Chinese proverb. Uh, I really like this one. Without, I haven't had my dinner, I'm going to have my dinner after this. Uh, without rice, even the cleverest cannot cook. I just think that's brilliant. <laughs> you might use it in a meeting at some point when you want to make a point. Uh, the key things to me are understand context. It's absolutely crucial and it's dynamic. It's not fixed. It's everything that surrounds what we're doing and has an impact on it, even if we're not sure how. Understanding who are the stakeholders, even the ones who are not invited. Managing the expectations of stakeholders. Now, this is a bit controversial. Managing or treating or engaging with. The point is, uh, we shouldn't, in my opinion, ignore uh, expectations of stakeholders. Crucial. So, I think that's us for the moment. Thank you. Without rice, even the cleverest cannot cook. I have. That's the last slide. Okay. Thanks very much, so, Andy. Um, so um, we have um, we have already got some questions from the audience. Um, so the first one is: Should a PM occasionally do sample deep dives into detail and speak to juniors? Is that, can I just say that is it? Is it down there? I don't know quite what's happening there. Is that gone now? Say it again. Sorry, Andy. Um, should right. a PM occasionally do sample deep dives into detail and speak to juniors, or should he rely only on what he is told? Ah, well, that's a really good question. Um, um, well, the short answer is yes, dive into detail, but it's a question of when, how. Um, it, it signals something. It's, that's a really big question. We, we could write a lot about this, couldn't we? So just uh, quickly put, yes. And I think that's the, it's about understanding how how to do that, when to do that. Um, doing it methodically might be a bit sort of not really appropriate. It needs to be based on, the, the, it needs to be based on the project manager's understanding of uh, current risk profile, uh, and and listening and reflecting on weak signals. Um, diving in it could be done quite subtly too. Um, and also the right people to talk to may be uh, right at the coal face, as they say. Um, on the other hand, we have the element of trust, uh, but uh, you know we have to we have, there's a balance there. So a project manager is a politician. In that sense, it has to retain credibility and has to retain commitment. So, it, it, you know, you, you, it, it's, it can be tricky. But y yes, I believe they should dive in. But how they do it, and that is, is a really important skill. Thanks, Andy. Um, the next question we have: Are good project managers made or born, or somewhere <laughs> in between? <laughs> Nature and nurture. Um, I think that um, uh, th th there's a phrase, uh, what do they call it, the, the accidental project manager. A lot of people find themselves being project managers um, um, anyway. Um, I think that th um, the context, the context of a project is a very important factor in um, uh, the success of a particular uh, person who is the project manager. So that's the first point. Um, that not a project manager who is excellent um, in one situation may not be. It could be to do with scale. Could be to do with uh, industry sector. It could be to do with an awful lot of uh, nature of stakeholders, complexity. So I don't think there's a one right way. Um, if we're talking about uh, some skill sets and personality types, which tend to be um, associated with people who are successful project managers. I think if we looked at Belbin, for example, and Myers Briggs as, as, as important um, instruments, um, then they're probably, I think, uh, project, a good, effective project managers are often, uh, 
you know, as I said, they're politicians. Uh, they're quite good with people. They're good at communicating. They're good at getting a point across. So uh, to what extent that is nature and what extent that is nurture, it is, uh, I think the answer is it's in between. But I think that, there, that people can be shaped or developed or can be self-developed far more than people realize. And I, I certainly don't think, personally, I don't think that people pop out at birth and, you know, are destined to be a good project manager because of their genes. But on the other hand, you know, we are who we are and, and our life experiences and our education and self-development are also factors. So I think it's a bit like the complexity model. We, it, it, there are no, it's a multi, multifaceted. Thanks, Andy. Um, so next one we have is how do we ensure competence and accountability in project managing? Uh, that's a governance uh, governance in there, isn't there? Um, well, interestingly, um, I mean, this is the IMEC key. IMEC key is a, um, a, a professional body um, with um, an important role in relation to um, charging engineers, and then there's the CNG. I'm, I'm, I'm an FICE. Um, so there is an, an important role for professions now. In project management, um, uh, the APM has now got this chartered status, uh, but it's not really biting yet. So, for example, if you go, let me give an example. If you if you go and work in, say, a country in the Middle East, um, it, it's likely that, um, it, as an engineer, it's likely that you would not be allowed a visa to work on, or you're not allowed to work on a particular project or project without it's usually, I think, six years experience and, and, and have a chartered status, right? That doesn't necessarily apply in, in the case of project managers. Um, in the case of architects, you know, you can't just call yourself an architect. It's a protected, protected word. Um, I mean, there are a number of professions like that. So I think the issue of governance um, in relation to the chartering and the, uh, the formation of project managers is a growingly important issue. Um, okay, the other thing is, so that's one thing. Another thing is, um, this is where I think the expert client or the, 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 the expert sponsor, if they understand who they're employing to, to, to manage and what information and what data and when and how it's formulated, um, you know, that can be important in terms of the governance of, of the project. Um, there are key data that need to be, to be seen. So I think governance is important, um, professional standards are important, um, uh, and where those things don't um, are effective, um, then th there can be problems. I'm not sure I've answered the question very well, but, but, but you see where I'm coming from. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Andy. Um, so the next question we have is, um, why do some organizations keep repeating the same mistakes? Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, uh, right. Why? Uh, well, it's Cobb's paradox again, isn't it? Um, uh, I, well, it's, I probably, hmm, could we got to think about that? There are, there are, I think there are a number of factors which um, would, so for example, you could have one situation in one organization and apparently the same in another organization. The factors may be similar, but the proportions of them and their interactions will be quite different. So um, fear, um, if you ask my opinion, my experience and opinion, and I've worked with an awful lot of organizations actually since I left industry, I've worked with a lot of organizations all over the world. And I think that uh, the culture of organizations is crucial. Fear of being told off, um, a message is being shot is not smart. It's not at all smart. It's, it, it's terribly important that people are able to say, even if it's misguided and wrong, it's better that people say what they think or what they think they've seen or why something got to work rather than feel that they can't or they're going to have some problems with that. And, and so I think fear of escalating is a huge, can be a huge problem. Um, so that is one, one reason why organizations repeat the same 
mistake because they've got they've got a culture which um, which, which um, or if you like um, promotes that situation. The thing about culture, culture is a. Um, if anybody wants to look this up, there's a really, really good stuff written by Sheen, S C H E I N, I think it is. Um, and uh, the culture has got, uh, according to Sheen, three levels. So you've got the visible level, what we wear, how we speak, blah blah. Then you've got this sort of level which is underneath that, which is. Um, um, not visible, but it's you know how how things are done and the rules and regulations of the organizer, and then really deep down is, is, is deep deep stuff. It's values. Now, so the top end stuff, the visible stuff, the behavioral stuff. Um, organizations do it, culture impacts on the issue that's just been raised there about repeating mistakes, and. If it's recognised that the culture has to change, and we hear this a lot, the the problem is there's this notion that you can pull a lever and change the culture. That oh, you can have some some people can go on some training and change the culture, and it just doesn't work like that. It's a very slow business, starting with behaviours and takes a long time. So I think that why the uh, things are uh, to summarise why things uh, go wrong again and again in the same way, if you like, is a culturally determined. And changing that is a slow and very problematic, um, but can be done. Um, and understanding that theoretically is important. Um, and I think there's, um, that's an important point. So people need to be um, honest and, 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 and look at this in, in a very clear way. We have, we have so many examples of this. Um, and there's quite a lot published on this, actually. Um, I hope that's, that's helpful. It, it's, an, it's my insight, at any rate. Thanks, Andy. Um, the next one we've got here is, um, do you have any advice on how we best stop those at a higher level thinking they know best, interfering and not taking upward advice, uh, filling rank and controlling a project? Well, I think that was sort of somewhat connected to my last answer. Um, yeah, well, yes. I mean, uh, OK. Um, there isn't a magic. There's no silver bullet. There's no big lever. Managing up. Managing up is really important. Um, over the years, I work with um, hundreds, actually, of students um, and um, po um, postgraduate professional students, students who are doing a master's degree. And I'll give you an example, right? People who are doing a master's degree part time, blended learning, um, over nearly 20 years um, um, in all over the world, um, a lot in the UK, from different sectors. and um, they did projects um, and their coursework was project based uh, and a, a, a lot of them, I worked with a lot of them and my role often was a mentoring role and I found that they would do a piece of coursework and um, on some problem or issue and then they would, I would be supporting them, often found myself supporting them to, to present this in their work context. And they were really quite, quite scared, you know, often they were worried, anxious, quite understandable. They were managing up. They were very critical and managing up. And, and so um, how to address this, uh, in my opinion, is that people need support in managing up. Um, and don't, that is the lifeblood of an organization's success. In fact, the thing I used to say to students, you know, when they came, industry students, I'd say my job as an academic is to subvert you and to get you to challenge. Because unless you do, your organisations are wasting their money. What is the point in people just saying yes all the time? You've got to be critical. Now, that's you have to be brave. You know what? I don't think you need to know any more, but you do need to be confident enough to say it. And this is the key. So confidence, managing up, um, and um, there are ways of supporting that. I mean, um, for example, um, uh, what do we call these? Action learning sets. Some of you may have heard of these. These are often, um, uh, I, I've been in them, I've facilitated them, where people from different parts of the same organization or different organizations um, regularly sit for two or three hours 
um, they get to know each other really well and they share problems and they come from perhaps different disciplines and they they help each other work out how to do and also they help each other understand look you know it's not you you know you really do have a problem yes you know they're not you're not it, it, it's not good because people can often get into a very depressed state and i think that there are ways in which we can support um people to do that and i think enlightened organizations do do that but it is very frustrating and i completely get it because i've been there myself you know um they know best and they're not and of course as change is happening so quickly what the context of, that often senior staff don't expect they don't have the experience of current context and so you know it's all very well but they just don't know and and, and i absolutely get it um i think there is no silver bullet but that's the anatomy of it to me and um, managing up so important support is important um and uh, confidence is crucial yeah thanks andy um, so the next one we have, um, do you think it's important for project managers to have a technical background, uh, particularly with <laughs> engineering? That's a good question. That, really, that is a really good... Um, right. My personal view is that... Oh, God, it's, really, it's a tricky one, this. There are, uh, there are a lot of people uh, who are well better known than me, I mean, well-known people in the field of project management, who argue that it's not necessary, uh, you know, project management, project management, and um, you don't need this or that. I, th I think the issue is this. People need to be credible. They need to have credibility. And in an organization, if people don't have credibility, they don't have any power. Um, and so there, there, are, there are ways that people can become credible. It's, but I think the mistake is to think that it's entirely a function of technical capability. It, 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 it might be, but it, it may well not be. Um, so you could have something that's terribly technically capable and competent, but not very you know, effective as a, as a project manager. In fact, maybe they're not asking the right questions because they're too connected with the discipline, not, not asking the obvious questions. So it's a tricky one. Personally, I think it depends on the, it, it, it very much depends on the situation, the organizations involved, the nature of the workforce and the individuals involved in the project. I, it, there, I don't think there's a simple answer to this. Um, should, can people learn enough uh, to be technically um, aware enough and therefore credible? Yes, I think so. Um, not always. So it really depends. And I think really it's understanding that there is no simple answer to this. It's not one thing or the other, you see, to me. Um, um, but I do, I do take issue personally, take issue with those that argue, oh, no, you know, project a good project manager can or effective project manager can, does not need to have, a, a, you know, a high level technical capability. It's not necessarily the case. But on the other hand, it doesn't function the other way either, in my opinion. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next one we have, um, what proportion of project failures would you guess were going to fail from the start and can badly set up projects be saved? Oh, oh right. Well, I'm embarrassed to say that I've forgotten there's a statistic. Um, now, um, uh, the, 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 the answer to that is, um, I really am embarrassed to say I've forgotten. Uh, but I, what I do know, what I do know is that um, uh, if we go back to the, st I started off with Cobb's paradox and Standish. If you if you look at that slide, there's a if you Google Standish and the reports, um, there is some there are some stats there, and it's I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that over a period, um, project failures have reduced due to improvements in project management capability. So, um, and I think, you know, we, we're talking about large failures rates, you know, 20, uh, there's 30, 35% going down to say 20%. Um, now it depends on the sector, um, but if you think of it like a portfolio of, of in an ISA, you know, you, if you've got a portfolio of shares, some are going up, some are coming down. The problem is projects, we can't have things just failing because each project's supposed to deliver something, not like shares, you know. So, um, I think a lot more projects um, 
are uh, suboptimal. I, but I suppose, I mean, the Tacoma Harris Bridge is an example of an absolute failure, right? I mean, the bridge didn't work. But then there are other things where it doesn't work brilliantly, but it's functional. So it's all, there is a continuum. So if we take out absolute failure and say uh, <clears throat> suboptimal outcome, then I'd say that um, probably based on Standish, based on what I've read, and I'm afraid I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember the figures, I'd say, you know, probably, I don't know, 20, 30 percent of projects could be suboptimal outcomes. Now, um, can, second part of the question, can they be out of uh, dragged out of failure. Well, if we go back to the um, 12 ways to wreck a project, then if we drill down and try to, you know, do the opposite of all those wrecking things, then in principle, projects can be pulled round. Um, number one. Number two, if however we're working right to left, so what I mean by that is, if there's an end date and we are, you know, um, X months before the end date and it's not feasible, then all we're doing is we're just driving ourselves into the ground and we're still going to fail. Um, if, however, um, we can reschedule and do all the right things, inverted commas, do the appropriate things, then but it will be a root and branch approach to resolving that. Now, I have been involved in situations where those sorts of things have happened, but they often involve change in personnel and pretty, pretty uh, severe uh, uh, medicine. Um, it, de it depends where we are on the project life cycle. Um, and maybe the solution is to stop. And that's why front end loading and spending a lot of the budget, and of course, oil companies, for example, in the past, I don't know about how they are now, but uh, could do this. That is a way of you know, stopping doing something which is a, a, a disaster. It, it's a very interesting question. Um, and there are people who are employed simply to turn around projects. And there are ways, there are ways of turning around projects. And, and but it boils down to understanding that triangle that Barnes talked about and really understanding, you know, where is the trade off? Where is the trade off between time, cost and performance? So it, it, essentially understanding the, 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 the pressure points. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Um, on a, um, I guess there's a nice following from that on a more positive note. Are you able to could you, could you give an example of a project that has gone well? Oh, I think the Olympics. Um, the Olympics was a fantastic project. Um, um, ha, and he, straight away, somebody's going to say, oh, well, it costs a lot more. Than, yeah, well, but, you see, um, <laughs> success a bit like the O2 Arena. It, it was perceived as a tremendous success. It, 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 it was a tremendous uplift. Um, there, there were lots of unplanned outcomes that came from that. There's legacy work which has gone on from that. Um, and I think that's a really good example of a very, very good project. And it's interesting that the con one of the major reasons that, 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 that is attributed um, to that success is the NEC contract the, that, that Martin Barnes, uh, in fact, that's where he got, I think he got a CBE for that, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, you know, he was mentioned in dispatches, you know, nothing to do with any whiz bang gizmos it was a contract it was the way in which the contract is set up to um any any disputes or conflicts are taken out of uh, they don't interrupt flow uh and they're dealt with in a, in a different way and that is why it's a very popular contract so that's i think a really good example um of, of a, a successful project um yeah, that, that, that's that's one that comes straight away tonight. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Um, we do have uh, more questions in the inbox, but unfortunately, we we are running out of time. But as a, a point to end on, um, I've got one final question. Um, if you could boil your advice down to one piece of advice, what would it be? When, well, who, who's the advice for? For for people listening. Uh, yes, please. Yes, no. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So I'm going to characterise people as people listening have an interest in, you know, broadly speaking, um, and it's IMEC, so I'm assuming, ha, I shouldn't, I, 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 I usually don't allow myself to use that word, dangerous word. Let's make a working assumption that people might have a strong engineering interest. Um, right. I think. 
uh, self-awareness and confidence. Absolutely, that's my vibe. Being as self-aware and confident uh, as, as, as possible. And, uh, you know, you can't get up tomorrow and say, I'm going to be confident in self. It's about development of one's self-awareness and confidence. Um, and maybe worth reading, uh, Goffman. Goffman writes about uh, playing the mask. And the fact, you know, that we are really, like Shakespeare says, you know, we are figures on a stage. It's, 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 um, it's theatre. Um, in, if we know lots of stuff, if we're competent engineers, if we're, you know, effective project managers, cost engineers, whatever it is, if we're not confident, if we're not self-aware, how do we communicate? How do we assert? How do we get things to happen? We, we, we have no, we have no impact. So I would say development of self-awareness and confidence. And, and in fact, um, so people ask me often um, over the years, what's the most important thing, you know, for a student, for example, doing a degree or whatever. And I'd say m motivation and confidence, because I've seen, you know, however bright people are, being motivated, committed and confident and self-aware, those people, every dog has its day, that dog definitely has its day. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. So uh, I'm sorry for those uh, the questions we, we didn't um, we didn't get a chance to um, respond to today. How, how many um, How many more are there, um, Emma? Roughly. Um, a, 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 about a handful, about five. Okay. If you send me them, okay. Um, uh, I could do, I'll do an audio thing, not like tomorrow, <laughs> but I'll, whatever, if that helps, and then you can post it as a podcast or something, and it's up to you. Oh, thanks very much, Andy. That'd be very appreciated. Um, and I'd like mm -hmm. to thank you very much for your time th this evening as well, um, from the, the comments that we're receiving uh, from those that are listening. I think um, it, it was a very interesting session, and I think um, people have really appreciated the, the advice as well um, so thank you very much uh, for your time today and thank you as well for, to everyone that is has um, taken the time to listen as well this evening hope you've all enjoyed the session and um, I hope you all have a good evening hi there so some more questions um, so there's a question here I'll just uh, read it out <clears throat> excuse me wasn't a problem with the Millennium Dome the expectation that it would pay for itself within 12 months, i.e. the original business case was flawed and unrealistic. It has since been very financially successful. Well, uh, yes and no in a sense. I mean, uh, that may be the case, that it was expected to be paying <clears throat> excuse me, its way after 12 months. Um, so on a financial basis, that, you know, the question, as the question says, um, now it's successful as a a venue as a um, an arena, um, very successful financially. Um, that is true, and so therefore, um, it was not successful financially. Now it is successful financially. However, I think the point I was making, um, which um, doesn't contradict that in any way, really, is that the arena, um, the, uh, the the venue, the the dome, wasn't. Um, it wasn't clear what it was going to do. It, uh, people didn't quite understand it, um, even though it was, uh, as I mentioned before, um, produced uh, within budget on time. Um, it wasn't considered successful because nobody really knew what it was about. So a bit of a white elephant in a sense. When it was clear, when it's become clear what it's for, because it's, uh, it's got a different role, or well, it's got a particular role now for a, and a function. It's it's seen to be very successful. It's perceived to be very successful. So I think the point I was trying to get across there uh, is that reality, if, or if you like, is 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 a perception, and uh, it's perceived to be successful as well as it being materially successful. Uh, they are they may coincide and may not. 
um, we can think of projects where the uh, functionality may be a problem, uh, but they're actually considered to be a success or where there's a, a very good functionality, but they cost a lot more than they should have done. So, you know, that these are different variables, if you like. I hope that, that helps. I'm just, um, next question. Um. <clears throat> Right, and the next question, uh, it says, it appears to me that many capital projects <clears throat> are financed and completed because bridges, motorways, and t tunnels bring kudos. Then the project ends and no maintenance ever done until they collapse 40 years later. Um, I'll say that again because I, okay, I'll read it around again. It appears to me that many capital projects are financed and completed because bridges, motorways, and tunnels bring kudos. Then the project ends and no maintenance is ever done until they collapse 40 years later. Is this a project failure? Yes, it is a project failure because if we consider a project, um, the, the, there are different stages to a project. There's obviously pre. <clears throat> pre-construction or pre-manufacture or pre-making or doing and then there's the the making doing or construction then there is the uh, period of use uh, after commissioning of course uh, and then there's decommissioning um, ultimately um, in the future now if the project um, fails if you like against reasonable criteria at any of those stages, then the whole project's failed. Um, so a project which is not maintained, or the capital, the, 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 pro, the problem here is, uh, one of the problems here is that a lot of focus goes on the capital cost on the, on the, on the, on the construction, production, or manufacture, the making. Uh, with, without realistic, um, uh, long-term um, consideration of the, the revenue cost, the, the cost of maintaining and keeping going, and, and in fact, including decommissioning, which is an expense, expensive business. Um, so that, that I think it's right to view the whole project uh, in that way. So that would be my response to that question. Um, now, the next one. As more organizations desire to have flat hierarchies, how to work up towards more complex projects? Surely that this implies outside recruitment. So job hopping rather than a long-term job. That's what the question, question has said. Um, not entirely clear what the question is here, but I think um, certainly there is um, a deep organization, one with many layers, isn't responsive, is problematic in terms of uh, project management. In fact, projectized organizations are matrix organizations, which we haven't got time to go into here, but basically they are not um, conventional or traditional. Um, they're not uh, role cultures, if, as, we, as we can call them, not deep hierarchies. They do tend to be more flat and there's more, um, they're more complicated and people need to understand how to be in them. Um, I, that's that's one one thing. So I'd say that a deep organisation, a flatter organisation, is more appropriate for complex projects because otherwise um, the deep organisation will slow things down. It will become transactional. It will not be responsive. Um, the question about job hopping and, and the, this is a big question. Um, in order to staff up for a very complex large project it doesn't have to be large to be complex of course um, in order to staff up uh, it, it is often necessary usually necessary for people to be hired in um, or for short term uh, relatively short term um, I don't think that's going to change in fact in fact that is a trend now and um, we are moving away from the idea of people having a job for life and being loyal to an organization. There are issues here, of course, which we didn't go into, to do with tacit knowledge, to do with loyalty, to do with um, settled connections. On one hand, the, you know, there are some certain disadvantages 
about the fact that people aren't a long time in an organization. Uh, there's the tendency to be more transactional. There's a tendency for organizations not to have memory um, and therefore tacit knowledge is lost. So there, this question raises a, a whole load of issues, actually. Um, I mean, it's several questions. Um, I'm not really answering any of them very well. Uh, I suppose what I'm trying to get across here is that organizational form um, and function um, in relation to projects, uh, their complexity or their scale, uh, are an important, um, the, 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 they interact and, and that is an important consideration. And then in terms of people's mm, roles, who they work for, how long they work for them, um, organizational knowledge, tacit knowledge, experience and so forth, is also really important, uh, a really important consideration in terms of project management. Um, okay. A question here, Andy, do you use PM techniques and processes for the household chores? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. But I think my, my partner, uh, my wife, actually, uh, uh, it's actually, um, she is uh, probably a little more hard nosed than me in terms of, uh, and more realistic, she would say, <laughs> in terms of the planning. Um, I tend to be a glass half overflowing. Uh, person, so I have definitely got. I have. I suffer from optimism bias. Um, so, uh, however, I do use um, some very simple management project management techniques. I think it doesn't sound very glamorous, but <laughs> prioritized checklists are marvelous, and um, I use them all the time. And I use them for whether it's work or whether it's dom domestic work or whatever it is. Um, I, I use th that approach. Uh, I try to, try not to plan from right to left. That's to say, create an impossible situation because there's not enough time to do things in. Um, it, when you are in those situations, you do have to prioritize. So I think um, the techniques I would use associated with my um, private life, as it were, is um, ri risk assessment, how to treat those risks, um, checklists, um, and um, a work breakdown structure, I suppose. So yes, the answer is yes. I suppose it's a way of thinking, a way of uh, perceiving things. Um, another question, uh, it says here, how did you consider a project a failure? And so how, how do I consider a project a failure? Well, that's a, a, that's a very big question, actually. Um, criteria, the minute we use the word failure, word isn't it so it implies criteria so what are the criteria now there are written down criteria uh, quality cost time or performance cost time those standard three but then there's my perceptions um, and so I think then there's other people's perceptions of other people's KPIs or criteria so it, it really is not either beholder in a sense failure um, it's a very Difficult one in the same sense, success. And so these are two very they're problematic. I think it's easy to look at failure because, in a sense, um, failure implies a sort of minimum requirement, whereas success, you know, you can be successful or very successful, um, if you see what I'm getting at. Um, I think failure, if we think about failure, we have to think about criteria. If we think about criteria, we have to think about those that are measured, those that are difficult to measure. Those that are, um, uh, are more um, uh, intangible uh, as well. And uh, I think what we're not good at, um, perhaps culturally, is valuing or attempting to argue for the value of the um, intangible. Um, and those are often associated with what the public or the wider audience considers maybe success or maybe failure. Okay, got a question here. Okay, it says, taking the example of the Berlin International Airport, why did this project drag on for 14 years till completion? Do project managers have the power to stop or cancel a project knowing that there will be financial loss and delays and start from scratch correctly? <laughs> correctly, I don't think there really is any right or wrong. There's things that work and things that don't work. Um, and then that's on this continuum. It's all relative. Um, 
project managers don't normally have the, the uh, capability or uh, sanction to stop or cancel. How they might do, it depends on in an organization where a percentage of the budget is to be spent before the sanction to proceed is um, applied, then in that case, the project manager at stage gate does have the, uh, or can contribute, if you like, uh, to the, uh, the organization's decision to continue or not. So that, 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 is, that is sometimes the case. Not, um, generally speaking, um, it's very difficult to, to stop. In fact, it's better not to start, or it's better to investigate at the front end and decide not to continue. And that is probably going to save more money and lead ultimately to more success. That's the first point. Um, in terms of um, uh, a project which is in trouble, i.e. is falling behind, the big problem about, there's a couple of issues here. If we're constantly trying to catch up, we'll always be late, we'll always be pressured, we'll always be in a rather negative mode. So it is far better to reschedule. Now, I've been definitely involved professionally uh, years ago um, in the oil and gas sector. Um, remember being on at least more, well more than one, but one particular project where I was responsible for rescheduling a project. Um, it was an offshore project, uh, fabrication of a of a gas platform actually, and it it was the the logic that had been drawn for the for the for the for the plan was um, <laughs> it was woeful really. Um, what had happened was the the planners had used um, software, they bunged stuff into software rather than having a, a, a manual, you know, a, 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 a prop, a good quality network diagram with all the logics and all the dependencies. And there were all sorts of implied dependencies and assumptions in the, in the way in which they'd loaded up the data on the, on, on the software. So when I asked uh, for the client, for the, um, as the client, for the, uh, the logic diagram, it, it took several days, and I think they were basically creating one. There wasn't one, so they had to create one based on what they'd done, and it, it wasn't any, it was wrong, really. well, let's say it was wrong, it wasn't very really good. So uh, I then produced a new one uh, with, uh, by asking, I had to talk to a lot of people about the method of construction, and uh, we, we then rescheduled the project, and uh, it, it, was, it was okay, actually, at the end, but it wasn't just down to me, but I mean, that was an example um, on of this sort of thing. Right. Um, who, this is the last question now. Who's responsible for selecting a strong project team to ensure it becomes a success? <laughs> right, well, um, it's a bit, I mean, somebody put it to me once about, you know, how do you decide what crane to use on a project, on a construction project? And it's the one that's available. <laughs> um, the people on a project are the ones that are often, almost always, are the ones who are available or can be hired at the time. Um, now, that's not to say that people are hopeless and useless and you can't use that. I'm not saying that. But um, you're, you're sort of dealt a hand in a sense, uh, largely. And um, number one, uh, fitting, people, fitting people to projects is, 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 in an ideal world is, is a great idea. But the reality is is not quite like that. Um, the the idea of doing um, the um, sifter approach to project manager selection um, is that it gives an uh, you know that uh, that that method I, I I was talking about the idea that that could be used and is used by organisations to try to see what level of capability and uh, experience a project manager should have for this particular project this plan is is a good start. But then you've got who You've got who you've got available, so it's it's again then a question of deciding who's best to fit this. So it's not a you know we don't live in an ideal world. Now who's responsible? Um, it may there may be politics in this. It, um, the, 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 the sanction on that or the, the call on that is depending on the size of the project. Of course, it, it, it's it's um, an executive in the organisation. It could be um, in a large organisation with a project. Um, function. It could well be the uh, you know senior project um, directors uh, who manage the project management function. Uh, the likelihood of getting a good outcome there is much higher than in an organisation where 
maybe a technical director or or um, another executive is responsible. I think a profession, a, a projectized organization which recognizes project management as a function and is a, demonstrates that by having a board member uh, who is actually a, a project, you know, responsible for projects, who's a pro, who's a skilled project director level person. The likelihood of selecting project managers and project directors um, who are going to be effective is higher than in an organization which where that isn't the case. I think that's that's certainly something I would argue. I think that's all the questions. Um, thank you.